Okay, today I want to talk about Rav Shaul, especially the book of Romans, the letter he wrote. And, uh, you know, people argue about chapter 7, whether that is autobiographical, whether he's really talking about himself. Uh, they look at that Greek word ego. Uh, I, it means I, the uh, first person pronoun, singular, I. Is he, is he, in what sense is he talking I, me, Paul, you know? But if you go through and you count all the I's, all the my's, all the me's, you see they're all over the place. And what I want to tell you today is that if you read this book, the book of Romans, and you don't read it as a Calvinist and try to make everything fit Calvinism, you don't read it as an Arminian and try to make everything fit uh, Arminianism, you don't read it as a Torah observant Messianic Jew and try to make everything fit that, uh, but instead you just read it and see that he's giving his testimony and it's all about him. It's all auto autobiographical. It's all, in other words, when he talks about the, um, the he says, you who are Jewish, uh, who consider yourself uh, a guide to the blind. Well, if there was ever a blind guide leading the blind, it is Paul the Apostle. As a matter of fact, on the Damascus Road, he was struck with blindness to show him quite literally that he was a blind guide. And so uh, when, you, when you start going through the book and reading it, you see it's all about him. He's giving you his testimony. And uh, today I want to just open the Orthodox Jewish Bible here. And uh, I, I, I want to try to mention a couple of things. As a matter of fact, I'm going to sort of go through uh, Romans quickly here. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 17, he's talking about the Tzitkat Hashem versus the Tzitkat HaTorah. Uh, righteousness that comes from God or righteousness that comes from observing the Torah. Uh, and he's contrasting those. And he's going to tell you that you can't be justified by the law. Even the Torah, you cannot be justified by it. He's going to tell you that in chapter 3, verse 28. Chapter 4, verse 2, Abraham was not justified by the mitzvot ha-Torah, by, by doing the mitzvahs. Uh, Galatians 2, 16. But I'm, I'm not going to get outside of Romans now. I'm just going to talk about Romans. He, he's, the, he's the one under the wrath of God. He says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Well, you know, that's literally true. On the Damascus Road, he met the one who is going to be presiding at the great assize. The, the, the one who is actually the judge for the Yom Hadin, the, the day of judgment, judge, the, the last judgment. Yes, the last judgment. He had a kind of preview of the last judgment. Uh, you know, a, an anticipatory, proleptic uh, preview of the last judgment. It was almost like on the Damascus Road, there he was, the last judgment and the judge. And he's got to get right with this judge. Uh, he's, he, he, he says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Chapter 1, verse 18. But in this book, he tells you that he himself was a vessel of wrath and that God turned him into a vessel of mercy and he did it by grace. And now he's under grace. He's not under any kind of uh, uh, legal... Uh, uh, Zoham earning uh, uh, mitzvahs uh, type of uh, to Torah justification and and uh, he, he he's the one who exchanged the truth about Mashiach for a lie. Who is a bigger liar than the man who says that Yeshua is not the Messiah and he was that liar and 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 and, and, and he's he's going to show how God took him out of wrath and put him uh, into a, a, a mercy situation. And God can have mercy on whom he uh, uh, wants to have mercy. And, uh, and he had mercy on Moses. 
uh, but he raised up Pharaoh as a, a, an object of wrath to show forth his glory. Uh, he had mercy on Paul. Um, he, he is the fallen son of Adam with a carnal mind, uh, in, uh, a slave to het kadmon sin. Um, and notice, when you see the word sin uh, in Romans, most of the time, if not all the time, it's about uh, the, the fallen human nature, the carnal mind that processes everything in a sinful way. It's not so much individual actual deeds of sin. It's the sinner you are, not just the sin that you do. And, and, and when he talks about death, he means eternal death, my friend. Eternal, he's not talking about just a physical uh, death. Uh, so he, he is the fallen son of Adam. And let me tell you something, his whole religion is based on Abraham. And, and, and when you go to the Torah and you look at the Torah, the whole beginning of the Torah is the genealogy of Abraham, starting with Adam. All those people bring us to Abraham genealogically. And, 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 and he, had the, he had the wrong idea about Abraham. Uh, he had to get that, that idea. He had to be disabused of that idea. And, and he himself was without excuse when he talks about uh, that in, in Romans uh, chapter 1. Uh, and, and he was the persecutor storing up wrath for the day of wrath in uh, uh, chapter 2. And because he was sitting under the law, he was going to be judged by the law. And, uh, and, and he didn't see that Adam is a type of the Mashiach. And just as Adam brought death, and, 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 and he also brought a kind of uh, a terrible warped humanity, Hetkad Moan sin that reigned from Adam to Mashiach, who's the last Adam. Uh, since, since all of that is true, uh, he, he saw, uh, he began to understand why he needed salvation, why, why he could not be justified by the law. Uh, and, he, and when we get to chapter 7, we'll see that. But the secrets of his heart were judged. Uh, Romans chapter 2, uh, judged by whom? By the Mashiach. Hallelujah, on the Damascus Road. So he's describing himself in chapter 2, verse 19. Uh, he's the blind guide leading the blind uh, when he talks about Jewish people. Uh, he's talking about himself in chapter 2, verse 25, and chapter 7, verse 15. Uh, when he speaks about the bris milah, that, 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 that bris milah was his boast, uh, but that boast was undermined by his inability to, to keep the Torah. If you, if you have the bris milah and you keep the Torah, then great, but, but if you don't keep the Torah, it's almost like you didn't have the bris milah. And these goyim who are becoming believers, who have the Torah of Jeremiah 31 uh, written in their heart, they're going to... Uh, they're going to show you that you are not the Jew you need to be because you don't have the spiritual circumcision of the heart that, that, that Moshe talked about. And because of original sin, I do not observe what I want to do. I don't observe, I don't do, I don't, I don't observe the law. Uh, so look at chapter 2, verse 25, and chapter 7, verse 15. The, the good I want to do, I don't do. Uh, because uh, uh, within me, there is a, a fallen humanity, a carnal nature working against me. Uh, he's the man who needed the circumcision of the heart by the Spirit of God, chapter 2, verse 29. Uh, uh, he, he had to have the new birth. A Jew has to have the new birth, my friend. Uh, chapter 2, verse 29. Uh, he has to have this, the Ruach HaKodesh. The written code is not enough. Uh, and and uh, the, the, the circumcision, look, he's not against circumcision. 
Look, look at Acts chapter 21, verse 21. A, a false rumor against him saying that he opposed it all over the world. Not true. Romans 9, verse 6. What if some did not have faith? He's talking about himself there. He didn't have faith, but then he did have faith. And, and, and a hardening has, has come in, in part to Israel. But in the same way that he came to faith, so all Israel will eventually come to faith. And he is exhibit A. He's the specimen they need to look at. Yes, he was a liar, chapter 3, verse 4. Uh, but then he made the confession. Look, if you will confess with your mouth, Mashiach, Adonai, and believe in your heart, hallelujah, with a new heart, a circumcised heart, a born-again uh, heart, you will be delivered. And, and, and he was under the power of sin, chapter 3, verse 9. Sin is a power, my friend. Amen. It's a power that, that, that was unleashed uh, in the beginning, the first man. Uh, he, and, and it affected all of the B'nai Adam, including me and you. Uh, so he's, he's trying to, to, to get right and stay right with God. And he can't do it by observing the law. Chapter 3, verse 20. He has to do it by faith. And, and law, the Torah, does not bring justification. But he is a, a, a machmir, uh, observant Jew, nevertheless. You say, well, why? Because he's a Jew. And because he sees Mashiach in every jot and tittle of the Torah. And, and he preaches uh, Mashiach in every jot and tittle of the Torah. And, 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 that, and that's, he's under obligation to everybody to preach Mashiach, the, the, the goal redeemer. And, uh, and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, the glory of original righteousness that Adam had that was lost. We, we've, we, we are all now B'nai Adam. We've lost it. We've, we, we've fallen short of that glory. He was made in the image of God. Now we have to be uh, remade, recreated in the image of Mashiach. And, 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 and when, he, when he gets to Mashiach and the, the tree, well, how does he describe it? He uses a Greek word from the Septuagint, illustrion, which means literally the mercy seat, the, the kaporet that was on the Aron Kodesh, Leviticus 16. And, and, and he is the lamb of redemption. Uh, yes, uh, he is the lamb of redemption, but he is also the kaporah uh, who calms down the wrath of God. Uh, you see, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, but Mashiach's uh, sacrifice is a propitiation of that wrath. And that's found in chapter 3, verse 25. So he is, a, he is a man who lives and breathes the Torah, but he sees Mashiach in every word, in every verse of the Torah, just as Mashiach said he would, according to Luke chapter 24. And according to uh, Yohanan, where he says, you, 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 you read these words because you want eternal life, but these words are about me, the Mashiach. But a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Look, look at this, chapter 3, verse 28. So yes, he's observant, but he's not depending on the mitzvahs for his uh, salvation. Abraham was not a boaster about uh, the merit that he earned from mitzvahs. Uh, and uh, he, he saw that about himself, that, that Paul could not be a boaster. He had been a boaster, but now he's not a boaster. He had to be disabused of Tzitkat HaTorah, uh, chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, and uh, being a physical descendant of Abraham is not enough. Look, there were, two, there were twins in, in Rivka's womb, chapter 9. Uh, they both were descendants of Abraham. But that wasn't enough. One has to be called according to the promise. What promise? Uh, the, 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 the Abraham, he was called according to a promise. The, the promise has to do with God's sovereignty, how he's promising certain things and bringing them about. 
uh, and, and uh, look at chapter 4, verse 13, where you see that word promise, and then you see it again in chapter 9, verse 8. Uh, and, and then he talks about uh, not, not depending on being a physical descendant of Abraham to get into heaven. Uh, it, it didn't help Esau, chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. Uh, uh, so, Yeshua, our Lord, this is, this, is the, this is the Savior. Hallelujah. This is who you have to turn to. Now, I, I've just been going through a few, a few ideas here, but I guarantee you, if you will go through the book of Romans, and if you will ask God to show you, he will actually reveal to you this is Paul's autobiography from first to last. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. You say, oh, I don't believe that preachment. Uh, death is just a biological phenomenon. I, I don't believe that sin transmits uh, generationally like you're saying. I don't believe that I have this uh, death in me. Paul talks about who will deliver me from this body of death. The, the good I want to do, I don't do. This, this original sin, het kat moan thing in me. Uh, uh, who will deliver me? Look, uh, I want to be delivered. I, I want life. Hallelujah. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. He met eternal life on the Damascus Road. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Rob Shaul. And, and so uh, this is what confronted Rav Shaul on the Damascus Road. It's not a theory, my friend. It's not theology. It's a fact. The Damascus Road was real, my friend. It was like a proliptic Yom Hadin. Uh, uh, proliptic means anticipatory. It was Rav Shaul. It was him having a preview of the Last Judgment and Moshiach was giving him a preview of the second coming, the Shiv Shel Moshiach, the return of Moshiach. He had that on the Damascus Road. And just as Kipa previewed this same event at the Transfiguration, the Hahish Tanut, the Transfiguration, so Rav Shaul previewed this event on the Damascus Road. So you have Kipa on, on the Mountain of Transfiguration, you have Rav Shaul on the Damascus Road. They're getting a preview. God is, has mercifully previewed them. The, the Last Judgment, the Yom Hadin. Friend, don't talk to me about Yom Kippur. Don't talk to me about Rosh Hashanah. Don't give me some little, our rabbis say this and our rabbis say that. I'm talking about you standing before Almighty God, a holy God at the greatest size, the great white throne. Are you going to be a sheep? Or are you going to be a goat? Uh, and, 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 and Rob Shaul was shown that he was a goat. He was a vessel of wrath, under wrath. And even the Torah brings wrath. Where there's no pesha, there's no, there's no penalty, there's no onesh. Uh, but but when, when there is a, a, a penalty, uh, because of Het Kadmon, we, we, can't, we can't have legal justification. We can't have legal sanctification. It's impossible because the flesh uh, wars against the spirit. And the Torah only shows us what sinners we are. Uh, so uh, he saw the preview. Have you seen the preview? Uh, instead of death, which is what Paul knew he deserved, it's the spirit. And the Torah only shows us what sinners we are. Uh, so uh, he saw the preview. Have you seen the preview? Uh, instead of death, which is what Paul knew he deserved, he, the persecutor, encountered grace. Hallelujah. Can you say praise God? Praise God. Hallelujah. So now a rabbi who studied under the Tana Gamaliel begins to rethink the Torah about this one whose name means mankind. That's what Adam means, who's a type of the last Adam who is to come, whom Rav Shaul personally met on the Damascus Road. Think about it. Rav Shaul met the last Adam, and now he's able to go back and look at the first Adam and understand him. 
because he sees him as a type. And this is just the, 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 the just as the power of Hetkadmon entered through Moshiach, I, I mean, through his, ty, his, uh, his type, uh, and just as with this power entered spiritual mavet or death, I'm talking about um, mavet olam, eternal death, spiritual separation from God. So uh, this this mavet, this spiritual separation, spread to kol b'nei adam. And, and and how do we know this? Because all sin. There's a phenomenon, a phenomenological. Uh, observation you can see everybody sins why is that you should find at least one sadik out there who doesn't ever and, ha and and has never sinned and there are some in the Hasidim who say oh yes we found him right over here here's his picture here's his grave and they're wrong they're deluded when Rav Shaul expresses this autobiographically he says it like this I was once alive but then the commandment came and I died and we've all died spiritually. We're spiritually dead. Amen. And we're, we're talking about spiritual death, spiritual separation from the Bashepher, from the Creator. And, and, and before, as a rabbi, he preached the Torah. It says, uh, Ye shall therefore be shomer over my hukot and my mishpatim, which if a man do, he shall live by them. So he thought, I'm going to find life. I'm going to live by the Torah and have life. I'm going to have life everlasting. Uh, so being Jewish, a child of Abraham with bris milah, and, and doing the 613 Taryag mitzvot, he thought he was doing what he, you know, what would help him achieve a righteousness of his own so that he could merit chaye olam, eternal life. So then he met Haye Olam in person. And he found out that the one that he had been persecuting was in fact Haye Olam himself. <laughs> what a revelation. Then he realized that as, as a Torah teacher, he was a blind guide. And the Torah was the embodiment of the truth, yes. But the Torah is supposed to bring you convicted and contrite to Mashiach because the Torah makes sin utterly sinful, provoking uh, the, the wrath of God against sinners, the burning fury of a holy God against all unholiness. So now he has to rethink everything. So Rav Shaul starts right away autobiographically, and he lets you know there is such a thing as suppressing the truth or holding down the truth and, and holding it down in unrighteousness. And Romans 1.18, uh, and, and, and this, this is an ungodly, wicked thing that men do. All men do it. It evokes the burning fury of God. And men have to be found out and exposed and arrested and divinely caught in the act of doing so. That they are suppressors of the truth. Oh, no, no, don't talk about that here. Uh, no, uh, okay, well, that's fine for you. And I'm glad you have uh, your religion and everything. But don't, look, we, we, we don't want to hear that in here. Listen, we have separation of church and state, right? So as long as you are in the capital rotunda, say nothing. We don't even want street preachers here. We are holding down the truth. Yes, you're holding down the truth, sir, because you're a liar. Let God, let God be true and every man a liar. And every man is a liar from Adam. It's called Het Kadmon. And... And, and he saw he was in trouble and that God's fury was going to flare out at him and destroy a lying Judas like him and a lying Judas like me. I, you're supposed to see this. This is about you. It's not just Paul's autobiographical buster. It's your autobiography. You're supposed to read Romans and say, oh, this is me. We're talking about me. The liar was caught in his lie. He had to confess that he was blindly spreading a lie, holding down the truth in unrighteousness, keeping men from being saved. He was a wretch. He was serving and working for and peddling sheker. And he was, it was either confess the truth or be destroyed. And on the Damascus Road, he 
confess the truth? Who has resisted his will? Who, is, who has resisted his will? So you semi-Pelagians out there who think it's just a matter of going into the voting booth and, and you can either vote for the devil or vote for Yeshua. Well, I, my brother, he didn't make a decision, but I made a decision. My friend, the second half of Romans, uh, actually Romans chapter 5, is a summation of what is understood to be the gospel, which is that man needs a redeemer. And, and there is a universality of sin and death. We're talking about head cotmon, original sin, uh, a fallen humanity that always uh, chooses something less than what God really wants. And then we're talking about death, not just physical death, but eternal death. And this man is hopeless. He's helpless. He, he, it says, in the right, just at the right time, Moshiach died for, for, the, for the helpless, for the weak. Like me, he died for me, even for his enemy. I'm the enemy. When you see that word enemy, he's, he's a talking autobiographically. Who was a bigger enemy than him? But Moshiach, who is an antitype of Adam, has come to reverse the condition brought about by Adam, who, who is a, the type of Moshiach. So sin is triumphed by righteousness and death is triumphed by life. And the new Adam will say, my food, the food not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, a moral autonomy, my food is to do, that, that is not my own will, as in moral autonomy, but to do the will of him who sent me. Hallelujah. So he's a different Adam. He's the final Adam. So one man is the source of death. The other man is the source of life. The, 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 the one man is a foil of the second man. The last man's work is, is inexplicable without the first man. So there are two gardens, one of error, one transgression, one mitzvah, one righteous deed. And then you have physical death is the separation of the body from the spirit. Spiritual death is the spiritual separation of each of us from God. Eternal death or the second death is the eternal separation of a person from God. And there's no escape from that second death. So Paul is under obligation to preach to everybody. The wages of sin is death. I mean, temporal, spiritual, and eternal death. But the gift of grace, the gift of God is Haye Olam. Amen. Amen. If it is your fear that my autobiographical interpretation of Romans is eccentric, look at what Henry Alford says in his classic commentary on Romans chapter 8, verse 2. There is no stronger proof to my mind of the identity of the speaker in the first person throughout, it means throughout the book of Romans, with the Apostle himself. Then this extension of that form of speaking into this chapter, nothing more clearly shows that there he was describing a really existing state within himself, but insulating and as it were, exaggerating it as so often to bring out more clearly the glorious deliverance to follow. So here Paul is talking about the uh, head kadmon determinate principle that functions like a law, like the law of gravity always brings you down. The law of uh, the law at work in my members. Uh, the the law that works in the carnal mind, uh, waging war against the law of, of my mind. In other words, uh, with my intellect, I delight in the Torah, but there's another law at work, waging war, as it were, against the law of, of my mind, and that's this determinant principle called Het Kadmon, 
And that's why legal justification and legal sanctification are impossible. Because the carnal mind works against the Torah and is actually stirred up as a result. So uh, the spirit of life, the law of the spirit of life, that is the determinate principle of the Ruach HaKodesh, uh, where, whereby I'm regenerated and I put to death the deeds of the flesh and I walk in the spirit and I, I have a mind that is, that is uh, conversant with the spirit and I walk uh, in the, in the uh, blessing of the Ruach HaKodesh and in the, the, the light of that new birth. This is what chapter 8 is all about. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the nature on what that nature desires. Um, now, to, to be carnally minded is death. Uh, and I must, I must, by the Spirit of God, I must put to death the deeds of the flesh uh, so that I can live. And, and I can do that. I, I'm able to walk in the newness of life. I would like to uh, encourage you to go to Bible Hub and click on OJB for Romans 8 commentaries and look at the, com at the uh, translation of the Orthodox Jewish Bible, especially for Romans chapter 8. Amen. So on... Um, the 18th of August, which was our homeless night, we were preaching in a homeless shelter. And four days before that, we were in the Hasidic areas. And, and what were we doing? We were giving out the four spiritual laws in Yiddish and in English. And it begins, God has a wonderful plan for your life. And some people say, well, I don't like that pre presentation because maybe God doesn't have a wonderful plan for your life. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's based, I believe, on Romans chapter 9, uh, which uh, is all about there were two twins in Rivka or Rebecca's womb. Mm -hmm. And before they did any Avera, transgression, or any mitzvah, righteous deed, anything good or bad, any one of the mitzvot ha-Torah, or the zohar earning, merit earning works of the Torah, before they had done anything, in order that, that God's purpose, his toknit, his prearranged plan uh, in the uh, Bahira, uh, the the election, in order that it might continue, in order that it might stand. Uh, she was told the older will serve the younger. So you see, God, God had a plan. Now, I, I've been saying that when you read Romans, you have to read it with the idea of, it, of the fact that it, it, Paul is speaking autobiographically, autobiographically about himself. And, and it, it should be obvious that, that election is, is playing a part here uh, and also God's plan. Because do you remember when Yehuda committed suicide and there were 120 in the upper room, and Kippa stood up. And then he said, look, we've got to have somebody who was with us from the beginning, who could be a shaliach witness from the time of Yohanan Hamadbil mm -hmm. uh, to the present, who uh, witnessed the resurrection, the Tahiyas Hamoshiach, and, and, and is an eyewitness of, of everything. We have to have someone 
to fill the pe, pe, the uh, pakuda, the the charge, the office, the uh, leadership slot, so that that uh, that there will be eleven standing with me. And of course, we know that on Shavuos, uh, when he went into the uh, Beis Hamikdash, the the, the uh, court of the Gen the court of the Gentiles, the Ulam Shlomo, and he stood up and he preached the first uh, drasha. There were eleven men standing behind him because the slot was filled, and uh, they they drew lots. But you know, there seems to be a theme in the Book of Acts that really that slot was filled quite supernaturally, God took the chief of sinners, he took a persecutor, and he seized him and changed him and made him a shaliach. This would be sort of like Osama bin Laden, he's planning 9-11, uh, he's going to, uh, you know, destroy those 3,000 people. Uh, and... Uh, the next thing you know, uh, the whole thing has been canceled and he's uh, uh, staff uh, with the Billy Graham crusade. He's now an evangelist going all over the world preaching the gospel. Now you say, Osama bin Laden becoming a, an evangelist? Impossible. Well, that's exactly what it was with Rav Shaul, completely impossible. But he's wanting you to know that God seized him and changed him. And it was, uh, a, 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 it was a glorious, supernatural miracle because God had a plan that when the great throng of the elect, the myriads and myriads and myriads of, of people uh, streaming into heaven, when that day comes right at the head, with Kipa and the, and the Eleven, there will be this one man, this Osama bin Laden persecutor. His name is Rav Shaul. Now, you see, it, it, unless you've been involved in Jewish ministry in Brooklyn or in Israel, uh, unless you've, you've, you've actually stood face to face with these persecutors mm -hmm. and seen the hatred in their eyes, mm -hmm. and, and unless you've been a victim of their... Uh, their little things that they do, you know, uh, throwing garbage in front of your building, uh, standing between you and the YouTube camera when you're trying to preach, uh, uh, you know, uh, the bomb threats, the destruction of property, uh, uh, blowing up a van, uh, stealing a car, and, and, and unless you've actually been around the Saul type persecutors, you have no idea what what a miracle it is if one of them would would become a believer. Mm -hmm. It would truly be an Osama bin Laden miracle. Yes. And that's what happened here. And he's trying to tell you autobiographically that God had a plan mm -hmm. to put a persecutor at the head of the throng of the elect. Mm -hmm. and, and that plan he worked out. And nothing can, can thwart that plan. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor things to come, nor things in heaven, things on earth. Nothing can thwart that plan. God is working out his plan. He has a, a prearranged plan. So he does have a, a wonderful plan for your life, at least in this respect, that Rob Shaul is under obligation to give everybody this plan. Now, if you want to say, well, that's your plan, God, that's not my plan, uh, and, and throw it in the garbage, you can do that. But uh, Paul is still under obligation to you, whether you are a Greek or uh, someone who doesn't speak Greek, whether you're a sage, whether you're a wise rabbi, whether you're uh, someone who isn't wise, it doesn't matter. He is under obligation to everybody. And that means that if you're on his wavelength and you study this book and you understand it, you really want to have one of these in your pocket all the time because you never know when you're going to have a divine appointment. 
when somebody is going to be presented to you. Uh, I should have had one of these in my pocket this morning. I went into Starbucks to get some coffee, and there was this guy, and he was asleep. He looked like a well-heeled millennial who had a good job. Maybe he was a, uh, an app developer, whatever. But on his, on his bare arms were all these scribbles, mm -hmm. all these tattoos. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, he'd obviously been up all night partying, drugging, whatever, and he was slumped over, and he was asleep, and, and, and it was almost uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, and he was asleep, and he looked like some kind of, of horrible case from Calcutta, somebody that uh, Mother Teresa would be scraping off the street. It's because, you see, he's bought into all the, the millennial stuff, and, and he, he believes all of the isms of the day. And he doesn't think that he needs this or that it's real. Mm -hmm. And so he has discarded it. He is now without religion, a religionless person, someone who uh, would mock uh, the faith. And, and this is what we have to reach now. The the so-called post-Christian uh, world where people have long since uh, apostatized from all of that. And I'm telling you that if you will go back and read this book, you will see that a persecutor breathing out murderous threats, a Pharaoh doing the same, that God can take one for noble purposes and he can leave the other for common use. He has that choice. He could do that. Pharaoh, uh, just one more enemy of God that was destroyed. Paul, one more enemy of God that was turned into his sheliach, his servant, his slave, his apostle. His replacement for Judas Iscariot, you, you might almost say. There he is. And, and, and who has resisted his will? And, and the objects of wrath prepared for destruction, the pharaohs and the, and the, and the Hitlers, they're on one side, but the objects uh, 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 prepared for mercy, the, the Pauls, the, the Paul, the apostle, uh, former persecutors. You see, you might think, well, this doesn't seem fair because who has resisted his will? But the point is, even believers still have to put to death the deeds of the flesh. This is not an antinomian gospel. If you are a believer and you are regenerated, uh, then by the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, you must put to death the deeds of the, of the flesh so that you might live. So, uh, yes, uh, we have a will. We have a, a free will. Even after we become believers, uh, we still have to do what Paul said. Remember what he said? I pummel my own body and bring it to subjection, lest preaching to others, I myself become a castaway. So uh, that's in 1 Corinthians, I think, chapter 9, verse 27. I can't remember. But anyway, that, that's the point I'm trying to make here. That uh, Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 13. For if, it's, it's just a little two-letter Greek word, but it's a big if. If you live according to the flesh, the sinful nature, the old fallen nature in Adam, you will die. And he's talking about eternal death. Uh, uh, so keep this in mind. We don't sin even more so that grace will abound. God forbid. Uh, we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And you people out there who have no sense of an obligation or a, a need to be faithful in, a, in the house of God. that You, you think you, you don't need a, a pastor. 
You don't need a membership in a congregation where the Bible is believed and faithfully taught. You don't need to be there uh, faithfully to hold up the work with your tithes and offerings and also with your prayers for the leadership to keep the doors open so that the congregation does not have to sell the building and let it become a Mormon hotel. You people out there who, who, who have the, uh, some kind of notion of cheap grace, you need to reread this book, my friend. You need to see who you're dealing with. This is, this is Rob Shaul, who uh, is working out his salvation with fear and trembling, and that's what you have to do. Because even though God called us, and even though he chose us, and even though the miracle of regeneration and all of these glorious things have happened to us, we still have to be, we have to live lives worthy of the gospel. We, we have to be vigilant and we have to uh, make our calling and election sure. Can you say amen? amen. So hallelujah. Amen. Whether you're a Calvinist or an Arminian, I want to tell you there's a there's there are some shades of both in this book and I don't believe that one uh, camp has all the truth I believe there's 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 some some truth here uh, from both camps but the point that I'm making is when you read it you have to know who the author is and how he's how he's talking about himself first and foremost in all of these things he was the Esau in Rivka's uh, 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 womb, who was counting on his being Jewish to help him get into heaven. And, and you know what? It, it wasn't helping him. Nothing was helping him. Uh, the, the mitzvahs weren't helping him. Uh, uh, and, and the more he, 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 he chaffed uh, and kicked against the goads, the, the more uh, difficult it became until finally he ran into Yeshua himself. Hallelujah. And Yeshua himself got a hold of him and seized this Osama bin Laden and made something out of him so that everybody ought to be able to see, if you have eyes to see, that the author of Romans is really not Paul, it's God. Only God could write this book. Amen. And he used uh, somebody who would be an impossible author, as it were, as impossible as trying to get Osama bin Laden to write something that becomes part of the New Testament. And this is so, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you will realize that this whole book was written by God. Because Rav Shaul is a major author. Most of it is either him or his associate Luke. Uh, and, and, and there's just a few small writings written by other people. Lord, I want to pray right now that you'll get a hold of this, of this generation that slumped over uh, with their tattoos in Starbucks asleep uh, from a wild uh, uh, night of drugs and lost without God, without hope in the world. Oh God, only you can do it, but we must be diligent. We must be like Paul. We must consider ourselves a debtor to every human being, whether they're educated or uneducated, uh, that we would give them the, the, the plan, that God has a wonderful plan for your life. Whether you're Jewish or not Jewish, God has a plan. Please let God work out his plan in your life. Amen. Don't turn your back on the Lord. He loves you. Amen. He loves everyone. He so loved the world. The world, the world that he gave his Ben Yochid, his Zun Fudoroibister, so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have Chaye Olam. Amen. Amen. Kappa, Eta, Rho, Ypsilon, Sigma, Omega. It's a little verb that really means preach. And it, it refers to the preacher. 
And it's found here in Acts chapter 15, verse 21, where it says, For Moshe, you know, we call him Moshe Rabbeinu, has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the shuls uh, every Shabbos. Now, uh, in the Orthodox Jewish Bible, when you get to this verse, you see that I use the term Magidim. What is a Magid? A Magid is a itinerant Jewish preacher. And when you read the book of Acts over and over again, you see that on Shabbos, Paul and Barnabas will show up and the elders in the shul will say, brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for us, please come up to the, to the bima. And of course they did. And this is where they, they preached the gospel. To the Jew first. The God-fearers very often would become believers and maybe one or two Jewish people. And then they would start a congregation. But notice, if they had not been Shomer Shabbos and Frum, uh, you know, that's a little Yiddish word, uh, Fe, Resh, Vav, Final Mim, from, if they had not been observant, and if they had not been Shomer Shabbos, they wouldn't have been allowed to speak. They wouldn't have been the Magidim, that you find this word in the Orthodox Jewish Bible, Acts chapter 15, verse 21. They wouldn't have been the, the itinerant Jewish preachers. I mean, to, just to be kind of almost comical and absurd, I mean, if they'd been eating a ham sandwich and carrying their shopping bag and walked into the shul, they wouldn't have been invited up to the pulpit. Do you understand that Rav Shaul is an observant Orthodox Jew in the book of Acts? Now, the other day, there was an Orthodox Jewish guy walking on Broadway around 79th Street, and he had his his uh, all of his paraphernalia on, and I said to him, do you realize that Paul the Apostle was a, a, an Orthodox Jew? Did that ever occur to you? No. I said, well, you know, a lot of people don't read the New Testament with that understanding, but it's right there, and I tried to, to open a conversation with him. This is extremely important because we have to go back and look at the Bible again. It is Orthodox, it is Jewish, it is a Bible. And why did he do this? He preached Moses. Go back and look at the book of Romans. The book of Romans is preaching Moses. It all has to do with Moshiach. Uh, it has to do with a, the type of Moshiach, you know, the typos, the, the type which is Adam. Adam is a type of the Moshiach. Moshiach is the anti-type of Adam. In other words, Adam brought death, but Moshiach brought life. Uh, Adam brought an avera, a transgression. Moshiach brought a mitzvah, a righteous deed. Uh, there are two gardens, you know. Moshiach uh, obeyed God in the garden, whereas the first Adam disobeyed God in the garden. We are saved from the terrible sin that was unleashed in that first garden by what Mashiach did for us in the second garden. And the book of Romans is Paul uh, preaching Moses. And Paul is one of the Magidim one of the itinerant Jewish preachers, and he's preaching on Shabbos. And the only time he doesn't preach on Shabbos is uh, when he's in jail or in prison. And uh, yes, this New Testament is written in Greek, but it's Jewish Greek. Hallelujah, from first to last. And Lord, I wanna pray that people will go back and re-examine the Bible. And they'll see, yes, Paul 
was observant, but he did not depend upon the merit, the Zohar merit of doing these mitzvahs. He did not depend upon them because he knew that the wrath of God was revealed from heaven. He met the Mashiach on the Damascus Road, the one who calmed down, who made the propitiation for that wrath so that we could be taken out of wrath. The Torah brings wrath, but Moshiach brings life. We're not under Torah, we're under grace. And yet, Rav Shaul was observant of the Torah and he preached the Torah on Shabbos as an observant Jew. It may be hard for non-Jews to see this, but I pray they will understand this and that they'll go back and look at Acts chapter 15, verse 21 again and see how from earliest times there have been these Magidim, these, these itinerant Jewish preachers, and Paul was one of them. And he took the good news all over the world. It began in the synagogue, every, in every city. It began in the synagogue. We pray, Lord, that the synagogue will again open its doors to the Magidim. And that there will be a day when every synagogue will be preaching the Basur Sake Olah. As mm -hmm. far out as this may seem, is there anything too hard for the Lord? We believe you, Lord that all Israel will be saved. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Right here, you see the Yiddish word, me. This is the Orthodox Hasidic Yiddish Bible on Bible Hub. Uh, it's uh, uh, biblehub.com forward slash OHYB forward slash Romans forward slash eight period HTM. Now, over here, uh, you have the Orthodox Jewish Hebrew Bible on Bible Hub. And uh, when you uh, look uh, at the text, you will see the, this, this Hebrew uh, word, which means me. So both, both uh, translations have me. Me in Hebrew and me in Yiddish. This is... Uh, Biblehub.com forward slash OJHP forward slash Romans forward slash 8 period HTM. Now, why is this important? What am I talking about here? That the, uh, the Torah of the Ruach HaKodesh in uh, Moshiach Yeshua has released me, has set me, has, has freed me from the gazettes, uh, the, the, the determinate principle of, of, uh, of, of sin and death. Now right here I have some receipts, because when I travel, I have to keep track of where I am. On uh, the 28th of May, uh, 2019, I was at this particular hotel then I went to this store, this store, and this store. And then uh, I met uh, this uh, a Jewish man who had thrown paint on the front of Beth Shalom. And it was very late at night, and uh, I arranged my phone to meet him. And as soon as I sat down, a policeman appeared, and he goes like this. Come here, you know, with the finger. Come here, come here, come here. And I went, me? You know, like, am I in trouble? <laughs> and uh, he gets me out there uh, privately. Uh, uh, we, were, we were in this, uh, uh, this uh, late night cafe, gas station place. And he says, uh, this guy, uh, I want to know what your name is. Are you Rabbi Max or something? I don't remember what he said exactly. I said, no, I'm not. He said, uh, well, this guy over here that you're, you're meeting with, uh, we got word at the station that he said he was going to kill this guy, Rabbi Max, or whatever the guy's name was. And, and I said, uh, well, look, he's meeting with a, a minister uh, very shortly, and I'm sure he's in good hands. And these guys, you know, 
when they when they first come to the Lord, they they sort of say, say a lot of crazy things, and uh, I, I'm sure it'll be all right, officer. Uh, but uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll take in, into whatever you you're telling me. I'll take it very seriously. So so then the policeman left, and I left shortly after that. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is. This young man is going to spend probably most of the rest of his life in prison. Mm -hmm. And why? Because right after that, he came to Brooklyn and he set three houses on fire. And he did try to, to murder the rabbi that uh, the policeman was asking me about. Now, why am I bringing this up? I, I, let me give you this example. Suppose you had this old jalopy and uh, the, the clutch, it was, you know, straight, straight stick. They don't have those anymore, I don't think. Maybe they do. Uh, but uh, every time you shift from, from low to, let's say, uh, high gear or whatever, or reverse or whatever, uh, there's this terrible grinding sound. And you got the, 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 the clutch is slipping and the grinding sound is going on and you have to drive like this. It's terrible. You feel you feel like you're you're almost uh, under the thumb of a slave driver. You don't want this car. You want a you want a new car. Uh, and, and then one day somebody offers you a new car. Now you're not going to turn it down. Well, let me tell you something. The guy, the the young man that I was meeting, he had a reprobate mind. And, and, and he was claiming to be a believer, but he was not a believer. He was not. He had not been transformed. Old things had not become new for this guy. As a matter of fact, he was driving the old jalopy, and he was grinding the gears, and the cl clutch was slipping. And he was going to go with that jalopy into prison for the next... 30 to 40 years or more. I think the, 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 the trial is still pending. But uh, he's, he's guilty. They've got him on camera. They, they, they know he did it. Now, now, let me tell you something. The reason I'm mentioning this is when you look at the Greek New Testament, you will find that certain translations have the, have the word me there like the King James or the NIV, they have uh, me. But other translations, like the New Revised Standard Version, have you. Well, it's important to get that right, and you have to go back and look at the manuscript evidence. And, and, you, ha and you, you will see that the Texas Receptus, the majority text, and some other texts have me. And it's important because Paul is giving his testimony. And I wanted to make sure that when I did the Yiddish Bible and the, uh, and the uh, Hebrew Bible, that I got that right. Paul's old jalopy, the persecutor that he had been, the man filled with hatred, the man who was wanting to throw people in prison and kill people, the man that, that, that was nodding approval when Stephen was being stoned. That guy, that, that reprobate mind, he had to get a new mind. He had to become a new person. We're not talking, we're not talking about your best life now, friend. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the old self being completely replaced by a new self. And if that doesn't happen to you, my friend, you're not just going to go to prison for 30 years, 40 years, 60 years. You're going to go to prison forever. It's called hell. Hallelujah. It is an eternal prison. And, and that's why Bible translation is so important. Now, uh, you know, when we do Bible translations, we never operate in a vacuum. We always work with the best uh, uh, people who have worked in the past. And in, in uh, 1877... Uh, well, actually, uh, he didn't get around to doing this until, I think it was 1813. Franz Delich in uh, Leipzig, Germany, 
translated the Bible, the New Testament, uh, really, into Hebrew. And the first edition was based on the Codex uh, Sinaiticus. However, at the behest of the British and Foreign Bible Society, uh, the uh, Texas Receptus was, was uh, chosen to be done. And the Texas Receptus, my friend, gets that word right. Paul is talking about me. What set him free from, the, from that determinate principle, that, that slave driver, that, that sin that always leads to death? Sin and death, sin and death. It's a law, like the law of gravity always brings you down. The sin that always brings you down. The old reprobate mind that is always processing everything in a way that is sinful and in a way that will lead to death. That mind, hallelujah, that mind was, was taken away and a new mind was given. And what, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about the Ruach HaKodesh took over. Listen, friend, you, you have to realize that the king was on the throne and he got off the throne and he, he actually died in your place so that if you would put self off the throne and put the king on the throne of your life and let the Ruach HaKodesh take over, let him give you the... the, the uh, the keys to a new vehicle, my friend, with no slipping clutch and no grinding uh, 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 gear shift, but, uh, but without all that hatred, oh, hallelujah, if only this young man had really, gotten, uh, had really gotten saved and really gotten delivered. That's what this, that's what this verse, verse says. It's a very important verse. Romans chapter 8, verse 2, translator, don't get it wrong. The law of the Ruach HaKodesh uh, has, has freed me, has delivered me, has released me, has set me free from the inexorable uh, sin and death thing that I was in before. And this kid had hatred and he was going to go to Brooklyn and he was going to act out his hatred. And he set three houses on fire. And I think there were like 20 people that had to go to the hospital, including a fireman and an e uh, uh, and a, uh, EMS worker or something, and a little baby even. And he, he didn't care because he was under the control of a reprobate mind. My friend, if you are not a believer, you are under the control of a reprobate mind. I know a girl right now, she's like a sleepwalker. She says, you know, I'm leaving my husband and my children. Forget about it. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to do what I want. I'm tired of this guy. And I'm, go I'm just going to walk out of the marriage. Uh, you know what? That is a reprobate mind at work, my friend. A reprobate mind. Let this mind be in you that was also in Mashiach Yeshua. That even though he was in the form of Elohim, he did not... Uh, he did not seize uh, that, that, that fruit, the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, where you do your own thing and you do whatever you want to do, that depraved will of the unsaved person. But he took the form of a servant, of a slave. Hallelujah. Not a slave driver. Your sin nature is a slave driver. He took the form of a, of a slave and he allowed himself to be uh, given a slave's execution in your place so that he could knock on the door of your hard heart, your hard and penitent heart and say, let me come in and let me take my seat in the throne of your life. Let me be the driver. Listen, friend, you're making a wreck of your life. I don't care how nice everything is and how much your grandchildren love you and how much money you have in the bank. Your life is a wreck and you're, a, you're destroying yourself. And unless you get a new mind, uh, hallelujah, unless what happened to Rav, Rav Shaul happens to you, unless this hate-filled persecutor becomes a loving shaliach apostle, Unless that transformation, that metamorphosis happens with you, 
my friend, you're going to jail. And that's what was going on here. And all these receipts that I'm showing you here is my proof that I met a guy who was going to be a jailbird and God was giving him one last chance to repent and get saved and be free. And he sent me there. That's why I went to Pittsburgh. He sent me there. And you know what? This, this video is for you. This might be your last chance, my friend. Amen. Just like with him, it might be your last chance Amen. to become free. Amen. He whom the Son, the Zun von der Reubischer, sets free is free indeed. Amen. Pray this with me. Dear God, I, I give up my seat. I let you have the driver's seat, Yeshua, Zun von der Reubischer, the Son of the living God. I give you the driver's seat. I know that I've made a wreck of my life. I know I cannot, drag, I cannot drive this 18-wheeler rig. I'm gonna drive this semi into a ditch. I already have driven it into a ditch. I've gotta get in the back seat and let you have the driver's seat. I've gotta give the throne to you. I've gotta get self off the throne and put you on the throne. And unless I do that, I go to jail. And it's an eternal jail, my friend. It's an eternal jail. If you will do this, if you will, if you will cry out to him, he will help you. He will never leave you or forsake you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. Oh, this young man, if only he had listened to the Lord, what a different life he could have. He wouldn't be looking at bars for the rest of his life. He would have glory in front of him. Listen, he didn't really get born again. He might have had a, an external religious conversion. Anybody can put on a Jews for Jesus uh, sweatshirt. We're not talking about that. Basically, he was trying to punish Judaism by saying, I hate you people for what you've done, you rabbis. So now I'm going to take Christianity. Ha, ha, ha. Well, the joke was on him. Listen, I'm not talking about changing religious labels. I'm talking about a change of heart. I'm talking about repentance and true teshuvah. I'm talking about hit hapet, turn around, where God makes you new. Listen, you say, that's not Jewish. Well, I guess then King David wasn't Jewish. He said, bara, bara, create, do a special work of creation. Amen. You look, you did, in the beginning, God bara the heavens and the earth. Okay, now what I'm asking is bara, in me, a left tahor, a clean heart. Amen. Create a clean heart. Psalm 51. Amen. Create a clean heart. God did a creationary miracle with me. With me. God did a creationary miracle with Paul. And Paul uses the word me. Amen. Romans 8, 2. Don't get it wrong, translator. And don't get it wrong, believer. Amen. Understand that you are born again by the Spirit of God, and you have been set free from the determinate principle of sin and death and jail in hell. Amen. All right, so Tuesday night is Yom Kippur. And right now, a lot of people are thinking about their souls. Uh, Kippur, Kofur, Kof, Vav, Fe, Resh. Kofer. It means ransom. And uh, the ransom had to be brought into the Beis HaMikdash, the Temple of Jerusalem. And uh, Moshiach said that he came not to be served, but to serve and to bring a ransom, a co-fare for many. And what, what is he ransom, ransoming us from? Well, for, for the redemption, for, for the, for, to be ransomed from, from sin and death, from, from, from the uh, terrible, uh, the, the evil thing that has ensnared us. And uh, in Judaism, the heavenly books are open. And um, 
you know, the whole idea during these days of awe between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is, is to make sure that you get inscribed. But Mashiach said, don't boast that you have power to cast out the Shadim, but, but rejoice that your name is inscribed in the Sefer Hayim, the, in the Book of Life. Hallelujah. So, uh, we, we really need to look at the Bible. Now, uh, if you take the Orthodox Jewish Bible and uh, you open it up uh, and, and you look at the back, you will see that the Jewish calendar is there. And in the back, uh, when you get to Tishri, you see Tishri 1 is uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah. And then uh, Tishri 10 is Yom Kippur. And notice it has the scriptures on page 1230. The month of Tishri, it has all the scriptures about Rosh Hashanah and all the scriptures about Yom Kippur. And uh, I don't have time to go through all of them, but I do want to talk to you about uh, your Kippurah, your, your atonement, because this is why Mashiach came. Amen. Now, on April the 30th, in 1945, I think on that day I was concerned about a little robin's nest because uh, on Tressler Street, right by the banister where I could get up, I was only three years old, I could get up on the little chair and then up on the banister and I could actually reach out uh, and touch the little blue robin egg because the robin had made his nest right by the banister. My mother came out, she said, don't you dare touch that egg. You leave that nest alone. The, the mother will abandon the egg if you touch it. Well, you know, when you're told you cannot do something, oh, then all of a sudden you have one uh, fixation, and that is you must, do it. you must do it, you must do it. So while I'm uh, uh, engaged in this little sin, one of my first uh, actual known sins, uh, uh, over in uh, Berlin, in the Fuhrer bunker, uh, April the 30th, uh, the Fuhrer had gone into his private study with his uh, pistol and his cyanide tablets and had been tested on his dog by his dog handler and uh, his doctor. And uh, they went in there to commit suicide and he had given verbal and written instructions that their bodies would be burned. Take them out the emergency exit into the garden of the, uh, of the uh, chancellery there and set them on fire with petrol or gasoline. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next day there was a new Fuhrer. His name was Goebbels and he was going to do his thing for one day but of course there was really nothing for him to do as chancellor except to arrange for the death of his children and himself and have his wife, I think her name was Magda, and himself have their bodies also uh, burned after they had committed suicide. Well, look here, how, how would God know this? Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And Hashem, the one deceiving, I'm sorry, and Hasatan, the one deceiving them, was cast into the Agam Ha'esh, the lake of fire, and uh, Gofrit, that's burning sulfur and fire, where both the Hayah, the beast, the anti moshiach that's the Hitler, and the Navi Sheker, the propaganda minister, the false prophet, the Goebbels, were, and they will be tormented, Yamam Valila, Leolam Olamim, day and night, forever and ever. So right here, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, the Lord gives you a picture of the burning body of Hitler and the burning body of Goebbels. 
2,000 years before it came to pass. Now, you ought to believe in a hellfire, my friend. You ought to believe in a lake of fire. You ought to believe that there is uh, the punishment of the wicked. It's described as eternal fire, esh olam, unquenchable fire. Uh, remember Yohanan of the Tibullah of Teshuvah? He, he appears in the desert, and he speaks about the fire that cannot be quenched, and he's quoting from the Isaiah scroll. Shame and everlasting contempt, not just Dera'on, but Dera'on Olam, eternal. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. The fire is not quenched. The, the fire of Goebbels and Hitler will never stop burning. It will burn forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. A place of torment and fire. A place where the smoke of torment goes up arises forever and ever. Revelation 14, chapter 10, verse 11. A lake of burning sulfur. Yes, where the wicked are tormented day and night, day and night, forever and ever, forever and ever, Garbles, forever and ever, Hitler. Surely a loving and compassionate uh, goal redeemer would not allow that. Well, he's the one that preaches it more than anybody else in the scriptures. Yes. He is, yes, loving and compassionate. And that's why when he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani, what, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's experiencing hell. He, he's experiencing it for you. Now, if you want to say, well, you know, that's not our religion. Uh, I'm just going to fast and uh, I'm going to flick myself with tennis shoes today. And you know what? My tennis shoes and my uh, my stomach uh, making those growling sounds, that, that's going to be my atonement. And also, I go with the Talmud, which says, may my death make atonement for my soul. He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He made the kippurah for you. Now, when people are kidnapped, and the kidnapper puts them in a coffin and gets a, a, a machine pumping air down there and uh, puts a little a battery light down there, they don't lay down there and say, well, this is not so bad. You know, uh, apparently uh, there, there's a ransom note, and apparently uh, my rich uh, father is being asked to give a million dollars to get me back. And, you know, but you know what? He should spend that money on something else. I really don't need a ransom. It's not that bad down here. I mean, I'm getting some some nice air here from that from that machine, and being six feet under in a in a coffin uh, with a little battery is not so bad, really. I don't need to be ransomed. Hey, stupid! Do you think you don't need a ransom? Get, uh, listen, ask God to take away the the, the heart of stone. And, and the uh, uh, ungodly, wicked, carnal mind and give you a heart of flesh for your own soul, for your own soul. You have to think about your own soul here, friend. You have to think about what it's going to be like to perish where the devil and his angels were supposed to be and you weren't supposed to be and Mashiach did everything he could to keep you from being there. Lord, I pray right now that somebody will wake up. That instead of trying to suppress this video and make sure it doesn't appear in Google search and, and try to hold down the truth and unrighteousness, that they would think, wait a minute, we're talking about my soul. What if it's right? What if it's true? What if he isn't making this up? What, what, what if it is actually in the Bible? Am I going to be as stupid as Hitler and Goebbels? Or am I going to wake up and read the scriptures? Amen. Amen.